In this video, I want to talk about the types of inhibitors you'll see in enzyme kinetics. And this image summarizes everything we're going to learn in this video. So I recommend you take a screenshot of this image and just memorize all the information in this image. And if you do that, you'll do great in biochemistry and on the MCAT. So we know the way enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. First, the substrate binds to the enzyme's active site. So once the substrate binds to the enzyme's active site, we form this enzyme substrate complex. Then the enzyme catalyzes a chemical reaction, taking the substrate and converting it into products. And then the product falls off. So again, that's the way enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. The substrate binds to the enzyme's active site, forming this enzyme substrate complex. Then we do a chemical reaction, taking the substrate and converting it into product, and then the product falls off. And sometimes biochemists like to use these diagrams to represent what's going on. Again, first we have the enzyme in the substrate. Then they react forming the enzyme substrate complex. Then we chemically take the substrate, convert it into product, and then it falls off and we're left with the enzyme in the product. However, there are lots of different types of small molecule inhibitors that inhibit these enzymes from catalyzing chemical reactions. So the three types of inhibitors I want to talk about in this video are competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors, and uncompetitive inhibitors. So first I want to talk about competitive inhibitors. So again, we know the way enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. First, the substrate binds to the enzyme's active site. Then we form the product, and then the product falls off. However, how do these competitive inhibitors inhibit these enzymes? Well, what happens is this competitive inhibitor competes with the substrate for binding to the active site. So essentially, this competitive inhibitor binds to the active site. And that's why it's called a competitive inhibitor, because it's competing with the substrate for binding to the enzyme's active site. However, every now and then, the competitive inhibitor is going to bind to the enzyme's active site. So when the competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme's active site, now it's clogging up this active site. So once this active site is clogged up, now this enzyme is effectively inhibited. And now the enzyme can't function. However, it's important to realize this is reversible, and eventually the competitive inhibitor is going to fall off, allowing the substrate to now bind and be converted into product. So this competitive inhibitor reversibly inhibits this enzyme. So it's temporary. So again, the main idea with competitive inhibitors are these competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate for binding to the enzyme's active site. And remember, it's reversible. So sometimes the competitive inhibitor blocks up the enzyme, but sometimes it falls off, allowing the substrate to bind. And again, remember these diagrams that biochemists like to draw? The way we would represent a competitive inhibitor is like this, where again, the competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme, forming this enzyme competitive inhibitor complex. But again, it's temporary. Eventually, the inhibitor is going to fall off forming the free enzyme, which can then react with the substrate going on with the normal chemical reaction. And this is the way the line weaver burr plot looks like. So this represents the normal conditions without inhibitor. However, once you add in a competitive inhibitor, the line weaver burr plot will now look like this, where again, the KM is increasing and the Vmax stays the same. And under those conditions, the slope, which is again, the KM over Vmax is going to increase. And in the next video, we're going to go into more detail on what this KM and VMAX means. So I have a link of that video below. So now I want to talk about non-competitive inhibitors. So again, we know the way these enzymes work. They take a substrate, it binds to the enzyme's active site, and then we convert it into product. However, the way these non-competitive inhibitors work are they bind to an allosteric site, which is a different region of the enzyme. So again, remember, substrates bind to the enzyme's active site, while non-competitive inhibitors bind to an enzyme's allosteric site, which is a different region of the enzyme. So therefore, they are not competing. The substrate binds to the active site, 
The non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, so they're each doing their own thing. They are not competing with each other, hence non-competitive inhibitor. However, eventually the non-competitive inhibitor will bind to the allosteric site, and once it binds to the allosteric site, this enzyme goes through a conformational change, essentially closing off the active site. And once the active site is closed off, this enzyme is essentially out of commission. It's essentially not working. And now that it's out of commission and it's not working and this active site is blocked off, now the substrate can't bind. So this is the way non-competitive inhibitors inhibit enzymes. However, eventually the non-competitive inhibitor is going to fall off. And once it falls off, now the enzyme goes to its original conformation, opening up the active site. So now this substrate can bind and be converted into product. So again, these non-competitive inhibitors also reversibly inhibit enzymes. However, there's another way these non-competitive inhibitors inhibit enzymes. Essentially what happens is first the substrate binds to the enzyme, forming the enzyme substrate complex. And then once we form the enzyme substrate complex, now the non-competitive inhibitor is able to bind to the allosteric site. And once it binds to the allosteric site, again, the enzyme goes through a conformational change, essentially locking in the substrate. And once it's locking in the substrate, this enzyme is essentially out of commission. It's essentially locked up and blocked. So again, we form this enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, which is essentially out of commission. This enzyme is essentially not functioning and not producing any products. However, this is also reversible. Eventually, the non-competitive inhibitor is going to fall off, causing the enzyme to go back to its original conformation, and now the substrate can be converted into product and leave, and now again, essentially forming the product, allowing the enzyme to function. So again, the point is, there are two ways these non-competitive inhibitors work. The non-competitive inhibitor can either bind to the naked free enzyme, essentially causing a conformational change, blocking up the active site, making this enzyme out of commission, or the non-competitive inhibitor can bind to the enzyme substrate complex. And when it does that, again, it, the enzyme substrate complex goes through a conformational change, locking in the substrate, essentially making this enzyme out of commission and not functioning. So again, the way we would characterize that on these, these diagrams that biochemists like to use is again the the inhibitor can either bind to the free enzyme forming the non-competitive inhibitor enzyme complex or the non-competitive inhibitor can bind to the enzyme substrate complex forming the enzyme substrate non-competitive inhibitor complex so again there are two places the non-competitive inhibitor can bind either to the naked free enzyme or to the enzyme substrate complex. So that's how we would show that in these diagrams. So again, the key point is that these non-competitive inhibitors bind to an allosteric site. So therefore they are not competing with the substrate to bind to the active site. Again, substrate binds to the active site, non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site. So therefore they're not competing with each other. And again, this is how you would draw these biochemistry diagrams. And again, this is the way the line weaver burk plot will change. Where again, this represents the normal conditions. And this represents once you add in a non-competitive inhibitor, where the KM stays the same, but the Vmax decreases. And again, this is how the, the slope will change, which again, the slope is just the KM over Vmax. We see that slope is going to increase. So now let's talk about uncompetitive inhibitors. So what's important to realize about these uncompetitive inhibitors are they're not able to bind to the naked free enzyme because this allosteric site has a conformation that makes it so this uncompetitive inhibitor is not able to bind. However, once the substrate binds to the enzyme, then and only then does this allosteric site open up, allowing the uncompetitive inhibitor to bind. So then the uncompetitive inhibitor binds, causing another conformational change, essentially locking in this substrate, essentially locking in this active site, locking in this substrate. So that's the way these uncompetitive inhibitors inhibit these enzymes. Because once we form this complex, this enzyme is essentially out of commission. It's essentially locking in the substrate so it's not able to catalyze a chemical reaction. 
However, this is also reversible. Eventually, the uncompetitive inhibitor is going to bind off. And once it binds off, we open up this active site, allowing the substrate to be converted into product and essentially forming products. So again, uncompetitive inhibitors are also reversible. So I know that was a lot, but again, to summarize this, originally the uncompetitive inhibitor is not able to bind to the allosteric site. However, once the substrate binds to the active site, it goes through a conformational change opening up the allosteric site. So then and only then, once the substrate binds to the enzyme, then and only then does the allosteric site open up for the uncompetitive inhibitor to bind. So then the uncompetitive inhibitor binds, causing another conformational change, locking in the substrate, forming this essentially inhibited enzyme. This enzyme is essentially out of commission, where it can't catalyze a chemical reaction. However, eventually the uncompetitive inhibitor is going to fall off because again, this is reversible, so it falls off forming the enzyme that can open up again, allowing this chemical reaction to complete, forming the product. So again, this is the way you would draw these biochemistry diagrams, where again, the, the uncompetitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex. So again, it's the enzyme substrate complex that binds to the uncompetitive inhibitor, forming this enzyme substrate uncompetitive inhibitor complex. But again, it's reversible. Eventually we reform the enzyme substrate complex, allowing it to finish with the chemical reaction forming the products. So again, these steps are reversible. So again, the key thing to realize about uncompetitive inhibitors are they're able to bind to the allosteric site once the substrate binds to the enzyme. Once the substrate binds to the enzyme, then and only then does this allosteric site open up to allow the uncompetitive inhibitor to bind. And then once the uncompetitive inhibitor binds, it locks in the substrate, essentially inhibiting the enzyme. And this is the way you would draw the line weaver burke plot, where again, this represents normal conditions without the uncompetitive inhibitor, and this represents conditions once you add the uncompetitive inhibitor. And you'll see the Km decreases, and you see the Vmax decreases. And again, the slope, the Km over Vmax stays the same. We see the slope is the same. And remember, this is an inverse plot. So when, when again, when it, the, the KM moves to the left, that represents the KM decreasing. So it's a little uh, counterintuitive, but again, because it's an inverse plot, when we move away from the origin, that represents the value decreasing. So again, this image summarizes all the information we learned in this video. But the key point is to realize all these different types of inhibitors are reversible. Again, when the competitive inhibitor binds to the active site, it's reversible. Eventually, it will fall off. So essentially, this competitive inhibitor forms non-covalent interactions with the enzyme. Weak non-covalent interactions allowing the competitive inhibitor to eventually fall off and allowing this reaction to be reversible. So again, all these are non-covalent interactions. And the truth is non-competitive inhibitors are a little more complex because in reality, we have a class of inhibitors called mixed inhibitors. And these mixed inhibitors can either bind to the naked free enzyme or these mixed inhibitors can bind to the enzyme substrate complex. And depending on which one it prefers determines how it changes the enzyme kinetics. For example, if the mixed inhibitor likes to bind to the free enzyme, it will increase the KM and decrease the Vmax, causing these changes to the line weaver burke plot. However, if the mixed inhibitor likes to bind to the enzyme substrate complex, then it decreases the KM and decreases the Vmax, causing these changes to the line weaver burke plot. However, if the mixed inhibitor has the same affinity for both the naked free enzyme and for the enzyme substrate complex. So if it likes both the same, then that's called a non-competitive inhibitor. So these non-competitive inhibitors have the same affinity for a naked free enzyme and it has the same affinity for an enzyme substrate complex. So it doesn't mind which one it binds to, it has the same affinity to both of those. So really non-competitive inhibitors are a type of mixed inhibitors. Again, non-competitive inhibitors are a type of mixed, competitive, of mixed inhibitors, which essentially a non-competitive inhibitor doesn't mind whether it binds to the naked enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex.
So again, this image summarizes all the enzyme kinetics information you need to know for the MCAT. So again, I recommend you take a screenshot image of this of this image. And again, just memorize this. And in the video link below, we're going to go into more detail on what's going on in these line weaver work plots and what does it mean for the KM to increase and for the VMAX to stay the same and et cetera. So I have a link of that below.